to the final Wild Ginger Running live show before Christmas. Yes, next Wednesday is Christmas Day. So today I am looking as Christmassy as possible um, for the last broadcast before before Christmas. So I hope you're all ready. Um, I have today eaten about nine chocolate brownies in preparation for the Christmas and festive season. So um, it's a good job I went on a run this morning. Um, so tonight we're going to do a QA. and a I've got about a dozen questions. Um, so thank you very much um, everybody for posting your questions. And um, I have got a couple of gear reviews as well. I've got a pair of Salomon shoes that I want to show you and a pair of reflective socks from Carabrite that I need to tell you about as well. We've also got a catch up with Anna um, who is our patron runner who is going to do 145 mile Grand Union Canal race in May. So we've got a little catch up with her and she is, um, I went on a run with her this morning and I have got a ton of questions and then, then we will talk about what's happening next. So when the next live chat is going to be, um, the Wild Ginger Running team t-shirts and buffs that you can buy and also the training camps I'm organizing in April. So let's start with the first question which is from Carl Hawkins and it is what is the best GPS device for running? He doesn't want to use his phone anymore, um, he wants a budget device. So he let's just um we put this question to all of the patrons just recently and there was lots of really good suggestions there. Um, so I'm going to take you through my um, what I um, did because oh, this, this is annoying. <laughs> I'm going to take you through my um, cheapest model and my advice um, for the brand that I like and then I'm just going to tell you about a couple of other brands as well um, which you might like to look into. Ah, hello to everybody on the live chat. It's finally coming through. <laughs> so um, hello to Carl Southgate. He says, looking very festive. Well, I hope you all are watching. Um, Conrad is here. Hello, Conrad. It's lovely to, lovely to see you. Um, let's just make that a little bit bigger on the live broadcast. Um, Carl Southgate, looking very festive. And Biker Bob says, hi, Claire. Hello to Biker Bob. And Baz Green, Merry Christmas to all. That's great. It's lovely to hear from you. Keep your comments coming on the live chat and I'll try and read out as many many as I can. Um, let's all say happy Christmas to each other. Why not? Um, so yes, back to the first question. GPS uh, devices that are on a budget. So my favourite GPS watch is um, the Garmin 235. So I've got the 225, which is the old version, and the new version is the 235. And it just does anything that you need it to do apart from it doesn't um, it doesn't do much of a navigation it's not a one that you'd buy if you want navigation on a watch um, if you want a cheaper Garmin model then the one I started out with back in the day like this is like oh goodness like seven years ago it was called the forerunner 10 I think uh, now it's called the forerunner 30 you can get that for about 90 pounds um, I've put links they're already there in the film description below that is how organized I've been tonight so you can click on that and that will take you through to an Amazon link. You might find it cheaper elsewhere, but the Amazon link just gives me a little kickback. I know Amazon's not like the greatest place ethically, but I haven't found any anywhere else that will is easy to do the kickback thing. So apologies for not being totally ethically amazing, but yeah, Amazon links. Um, so yeah, the cheapest model is the 4 out of 30, about 90 pounds. And then if you're a regular runner and you don't need like navigation functions, the 4 out of 235, is what I would recommend. It's about £130. And then if you want navigation with the Garmin, I would go for a Fenix 5. That's what I used on the Cape Breath Ultra. And they, I've seen them on Amazon for £355. So that's pushing the boat out a bit. You better have been really good for Santa if you want one of them in your stocking. So that's Garmin. But then we were having a bit of a chat on the on the patron exclusive Facebook group, you see. And um, Bob Deary, who's one of my newest patrons. Um, hello to Bob, if you're watching. Um, thank you very much for for your support. Um, he was suggesting the Coros uh, brand, which a lot of the American trail runners have been speaking about recently. I've seen reviews from the Ginger Runner, um, Sage Canada has been using them as well. And they've been really rating them, especially for their long battery 
life, um, which um, sounds really great, so I need to get my hands on one soon, but Bob has already been testing these. He's already tried the Coros Pace, which I found for about £180 on Amazon. Um, links are in the description below. And then he's just literally upgraded to the Apex Pro. So um, that's I found that for about just under £300 um, on Amazon. Um, so that could be the way to go. Um, if, but still for your whole budget option, you'd be looking at more of the pace level and that's still a bit more expensive than the Forerunner 30, which does your basic, you know, like just your heart rate, your speed, your distance, just basic watch functions like you'd find on an app that you have on your phone. Um, so uh, still the Garmin Forerunner 30 is sort of like the, the best basic, the cheapest option there. Um, and then um, our, I can't not mention Sunto because they are the other big brand. There's also Polar as well, but um, I only really go for Garmin and Sunto, and then I'm going to try out Coros. Um, uh, Polar is is also good, um, but every time I've tested Polar in like tests for trail running magazine, they just they just don't have the same level of functionality as the Garmin's and the Sunto do. So I've I've always just gone for those ones myself. Um, so. It, Sunto wise the newest one from Sunto is the 5 um, and that that does loads of things including navigation for only £219 so that's kind of like a bit of a competitor for the Fenix 5 there um, but if you wanted to go cheap within Sunto then you'd probably be looking at more like the Sunto 3 Fitness which is £125 I found it for so over all of those watches the only one that I found for under £100 is the Garmin 4 Runner 30 so if you do want a really really budget GPS watch that's got a heart rate on the wrist and you just want to get out there and run and you just want a few stats on it just like your app on your phone I I would go for the Forerunner 30. It's it's tried and tested. I used it as my first watch in its first incarnation before it got all snazzy and flat and streamlined. Um, so yeah, it's a really good watch just for those basic functions. But I think if you're a regular runner and you want to know more and you want to maybe program in some interval training, stuff like that, then the 235 is a really, really awesome watch. Um, and I'm just going to read out a few more hellos because there is um, lots of, oh, lots of chat going on. Um, I think a Biker Bob is going to be Bob Deary. He says, that's me. There we go. It's excellent to have you watching, Bob, and thank you very much for your support on Patreon. Um, so, Abby Norman is here. She says, hello, Claire and everyone. Hello to you, Abby. It's fantastic to see you here. Um, John Gardner says, uh, hello, everyone. Claire's hair fits right into the holiday colours. Yes. Oh, yes, it does. It's like just blending into that tinsel there, isn't it? <laughs> we did, um, we went um, on our Christmas carol run last night with our running club, and um, we sing, we go to all the houses that are really, really brilliantly decorated there's about three or four there's a pub there's a house there's someone else's house and then we end at the christmas tree um in the town center and we sing a carol so we all run um and then we sing a carol at each location um and i wore this and i was so hot <laughs> even though it was really really freezing last night i nearly had to take this off and other people they were having various like jingling things um on them so it was yeah it was very very funny it was, it was very very amusing um Stephen Mackey Mackey says love the hat so Stephen came on our patron run just last Saturday and he wore a whole Santa outfit if you haven't seen the film of our patron run google wild ginger running patron Christmas and it will come up with that film it's just it's one of the most recent ones on the website so you will see Stephen dressed in a whole Santa outfit so like you by far you outdid me Stephen there so this is just a, a tiny fraction of what is achievable on a run Guy Greatrex says hello hey to Guy Hello, Guy Greater X won our last month's competition. So um hope everybody is feeling lucky. Um Guy certainly was last month. Uh, so hello to him. And he organized the patron meetup as well. So thank you very much, Guy. Nigel Barnett says hello. Hello to you. Absolutely fantastic to have you watching as well. And Gary Simmington. Um, he also says love the hat. Um, and uh Tom Avery says hello as well. And Amblin Cork says hello from Wet and Windy. Ireland so uh, oh John Gardner says just coming back to the whole reason that we were talking just now about GPS watches he uses the Forerunner 235 um, it's reliable and um, good um, he, it can be charged on the run as well whilst tracking everything as well the wrist HR is okay it's occasionally off target 
Yes, I sometimes find that the wrist HR, if you get cold, it can't detect your pulse very well anymore. So especially with trail running, when you're running up mountains and things, the heart rate on the wrist isn't as accurate, I would say, than the chest strap. But I find the chest straps really annoying and I'm not an elite level athlete. So I don't need like precision heart rate knowledge. So I just put up with a slight amount of inaccuracies. Um, uh, yes, the, that's and that's another really good point that John makes there is that the Garmin watch, um, the one that I have, the 225 and also his 235, you can charge them whilst you're using them. So you can clip them into there. I think I've got mine just here actually. Yeah, here it is. So you can actually um, use the watch whilst it's clipped in to its um, charger and you can use a portable charger on the end. I use the um, Goal Zero Flip 10. They're like a lipstick size charger and you just plug it in, pop it in your rucksack pocket in your pocket and um, you can run along with it charging so that just immediately extends the battery life of any watch that you've got um i i tried it with the sunto and i don't think you can use the sunto whilst um whilst charging it at the same time sometimes with the newer garments as well the charger is a thing which you stick in the back so you can't wear them whilst you're charging them so it's just something to be aware of if you're buying a gps watch it's just can you charge it while still tracking your movements and using it so it's just one of the other things to consider if your watch doesn't have a great battery life and you really like doing ultra running um yeah um so uh conrad has something to say about this as well his um i don't know why the backdrop on here is um actually grayed out oh let, let's let's just have background um let's see if that works better um nope that's not better let me just try and arrange this background so that it's background okay background um color okay a white let's try white yes that's better now you can actually see people's questions see people's comments coming in so um uh, Conrad Anderson, um, all the way from Michigan, says his Sunto Spartan Sport has been wonderful. It's got a good battery life, breadcrumb trail, and you can find it good quality used ones on eBay. So that's really handy to know. Thanks for that. Um, and uh, Biker Bob, um, Bob Deary says, if you want reliable HR, it needs to be a chest strap. Yes, unfortunately it does. Um, it's, yeah, it's just not quite as reliable as a chest strap to have it on the, on the wrist, but it's a good compromise if you're not too bothered about precision, precision analytics after you run. Um, James Frost says, uh, lipstick, don't use that stuff. What is it in centimeters? I will show you the flip 10. I've just been charging one. So this is the Goal Zero Flip 10. And this is what I regularly use for charging of all my appliances on the run. So they're so handy. They weigh about 70 grams. Um, so if I just press that there, you can see that it's fully charged. Um, what you do is you insert your USB just in there. The great thing about these is that you can charge them whilst they're charging something else as well. So if you have got access to power, you can charge this and charge your, um, your gizmo at the same time. So I take a couple of these on every run because I need to charge up my iPhone if I'm taking pictures and I also need to charge up my GoPro as well so the GoPro lasts kind of two hours iPhone will last kind of it depends what you're using it for but sometimes a whole day and sometimes it just needs a top up by the end of a day run so yeah goal zero flip 10 really really good don't bother buying one of these from the pound shop they do not work my grandma bought me one for a pound from the pound shop didn't work this is 22 quid it but it works so there, you know, it's a bit of money. You'll notice that, but it definitely works. And these have been working for years and years for me. And they're kind of bomb proof as well. If you drop them, they, they're not going to break. So yeah, that's my little tip there. Um, fab. Okay, so we should move on to the next question now, shouldn't we? So the next question is, oh, this is an interesting question because it's about groin strain. So um, this is from Christian Seymour. And... Um, He's been plagued with injury um, this year, and it's a groin strain. So um, so he says, is there a miracle fix, or should I hang up my trail shoes and grow old and fat? Um, so no, no, definitely don't have to grow old and fat. And I have been just doing a little bit of research in uh, my go-to book for injuries. So this is a book that I really recommend. The details are in the description, film description below, Running Free of Injuries. So this is by a physio called Paul Hobra. People who are fans of the channel will know I like the, this is like my Bible for injury. Um, I use this all the time and I recommend it to everybody anything kind of 
leg, lower leg, uh, he knows everything. Um, so I have opened it at the groin strain um, area and um, you said you've been seeing a chiropractor and doing stretches, but have you seen a physio? I'm really sorry, I'm gonna just have to take this off because it's, it's really, really hot. <laughs> I've, got this, I've got this light here, you see, because it's dark. So I've got this light on, but it's really, really hot. Um, so, um, so yes, uh, basically, uh, he doesn't mention anything about a chiropractor in this book. He says go to a physio. So um, he he says you've got to go to a physio and they're going to do some massage to your adductor muscles and some deep transverse frictions to the site of injury, which sounds painful. So gird your loins, Christian. Um, then um, there's basic things that the physio has to do, but also you can do some self-treatment. So I'll just read you this, but I think there's, there's a whole kind of few pages and then a whole chapter on the hip and pelvis in here, um, just here. So I think it'd be a really good idea to get this book um, and sort of digest it, like devour it, um, because it really will help you. So he's given some exercises here for self-treatment and the exercises are all in this book as well. So he's, he's a, a um, advocating that you do some hip flexor stretching, um, a hamstring stretch, um, ITB and TFL stretches, um, some abduction in like doing the side plank on a Swiss ball, um, and foam rolling your quad muscles, the front of your thighs as well. Um, so he's he, he there's and there's a client story here as well, and there's like a whole protocol that you can give to your physio to just. Um, I don't know, instruct them and make sure that they, they know what's getting going on. Um, and also he says a bit here about how to get back into running. Um, and one of the important things that you should probably know for trail running is that with when you have a groin strain, it's more difficult to run on uneven ground. So you might want to shorten your stride for a bit and you might want to run on really even smooth trails, you know, like canal towpaths and things like that, or even some road running just for a bit, because it says here, um, that the healing needs to take place and you might not be able to run on uneven ground and you might have a shorter stride. So um, I think best plan, Christian, is to see a physio. So if you've got anyone in your running club that can recommend you a trusted sports physio, um, then that would be my first port of call, especially if your injury's been going on for a while now and the chiropractor's not sorted it out and the stretching hasn't sorted it out. I'd go and see a physio that you really, really trust. Um, I would also get this book as well, just to kind of sell manage yourself through this um through this injury um and i would advise anyone if you haven't like niggle then go and see a physio straight away and also refer to this book because it's like the bible for running industry um, injuries um so that would be my advice to you i hope that helps christian and i hope the groin strain um does ease off very very soon great um, oh, we have a comment from Guy Greatrex. He says he loves that book, this book, Running Free of Injuries. Um, link is in the description below. Um, uh, it helped him with his knee. So there you go. Um, a recommendation already. Um, I should also point out that Paul Hobra, who wrote the book, he um, he's done work on Paula Radcliffe and also Steve Cram. So uh, both world record holders in their time um, for uh, the various distances um, on uh, tracks and roads. So he knows what he's talking about with running. Okay, so question number three. Oh, this is a really, really interesting question. Um, a very interesting question because I am just writing a book at the moment and the book um, contains some training plans. So this question is from Jayster2018. Um, he's seen my film on the YouTube channel, which is called How to Start Trail Running. Um, and, and he's just signed up for the Endurance Life Half Marathon on the Downs. Not sure if it's North or South Downs, but undulating nevertheless he's looking for a decent training plan so what would I recommend okay so this is where it's it does get a little bit complicated because um, to do a road half marathon it's quite easy to follow a generic training plan because you know it's going to be pretty much kind of usually quite flat there might be some undulations but it's usually quite flat you know the terrain is going to be a road um, and you kind of know for the fitness level how long 
things are going to take people. Um, so it's quite easy to follow a generic training plan for road running. But then with for trail running, you could sign up to a half marathon and it could be a really easy flat half marathon on really smooth, easy trails. Or it could be a really tough half marathon, like in the mountains, over rocks, over um, like really tough terrain. And it could take ages so you're talking for i'm thinking i'm just guessing in the downs whether it's north or south they are undulating but the trails are not particularly like terrifyingly rocky they're going to be nice sort of maybe a bit muddy it's going to be march it's going to be muddy it might be a bit icy depends on the kind of march we have this year could go either way with march so uh, I'm kind of thinking it could take you, if you're a really super speedy runner, that kind of thing could take you two hours if you're really speedy, but more likely most people will be looking at three hours for that kind of a marathon. Like I'm just trying to think about how long it would take me to do a marathon with some undulations and ascent and kind of, you know, a bit more difficult paths than roads. And a half marathon would probably take me, yeah, maybe three hours, depends how much I was filming. Um, so to train up for a three hour run um, on trails, um, I would train, I would try to train mostly on trails um, and the best possible thing you could do would be to get um, a personalized training plan from somebody really trustworthy. So the person I'm going to recommend to you is the coach for our trail running training camp in April 24th to the 26th of April in Castleton in the Peak District. Um, so oh, I'll just put the link up in case anyone wants to find out more about it. Uh, it's here. So um, I would then um, I would go to him and I would, that he's really reasonable, um, just to, he will get from you everything that you do right now and he'll make a personalized training plan and that will give you the absolute best performance. But if you want more of a generic plan, if like this is your first thing and you, you, you know, you've already bought the race, you've bought the gear and then you're like, oh, I don't want to spend any more money, um, then I totally understand. And here is my um, advice for training for a half marathon. So for training for a half marathon trails, I would do like three to four runs a week and a strength session. If you've got time for any more sessions, I'd probably do cross training like swimming or cycling just so that you don't run yourself into the ground. Um, if you if you can run five times a week, then great, that's fantastic. But I just find that once I go over four times a week, I start to get niggles, start to get a bit injured. So um, so I would turn to cycling or, or, um, or um, swimming. So 30 to 60 minutes swimming and um, one to two hours cycling. Um, so, um, what I would do, uh, let's ba break it down into three runs per week just to start with. So I do one fun run, so really steady, like a chatting pace, um, uh, focus on your form, maybe try out some navigation, be sociable, just really enjoy it. So that's one run. And um, the, the other run I would do would be a speed session. So that's either a tempo run or a hill session, like hill intervals where you're sprinting up the hill and then jogging back down. Um, if you're really, really new to all of this, then I wouldn't perhaps do the speed session. I would just do another fun run um, just because you're just getting the hang of it. You're just uh, building up that aerobic base of just going at chatting pace so I would just do the fun run if you're a comp if you're quite a beginner but if you um if you're used to sport and you're used to exercise a speed session per week would be great then I would do one long run so this is your third run so using time rather than distance a lot of the generic training plans for road running you'll get a distance marker on there but for trail running it, we m more like calculate things in terms of time because um, it's time on your feet rather than going a certain distance because you never know how hilly it's going to be. So I'd go for building up to whatever you run right now is your longest run. I'd build it up by 10% every week. Um, that's a, a considered sensible um, so that you don't get injured. 10% um, per week. Um, so say if you can run for an hour right now, then do one hour and five minutes next week and then build it up by five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, then by 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. It doesn't have to be exactly 10%, but around that amount. Um, so yeah, build it up. I, would, I wouldn't I would say that even if you're going to run for three hours in this half marathon, even if you're estimating that, I'd say that in training, you'd only need to go up to two hours of running. If you can run 
steadily for two hours um, and not feel tired afterwards, you're going to be able to crack out that three hours on, on race day. Um, you could go up to two and a half hours just to give yourself a bit of a um, psychological uh, confidence. Um, but two hours, I would say, if you can run steadily for two hours, you can do a three hour um, half marathon. Um, and it just means that you're not going out all the time for three hour runs and being really tired and, and not getting the benefit of the training. So um yeah so that's the three runs that i would do and if you can do one more run then make it another fun run steady chatting pace so that's your fourth run um or do a cross training um like swimming or cycling um i would also do one strength session per week so that's like your squats lunges planks press ups russian twists and um and also v sits and things like that um i have got a hit strength workout on my channel so i'll link to it here afterwards um up here the little thing will come up an i card thing so click on that if you want hit training um i just need to make a note of what time i've said that so i can add it in 25 is on the dot okay great um so i do have hit training hit is strength training and cv at the same time so it's like it's strength moves that you um that complement your running um and like plyometric jumping around um and it's also a fitness boost as well so it's a 15 minute film um so you could do that every week and that would stand you in really good stead um you don't have to include cv um cardio work like getting out of breath type work in your strength training you should really be focusing on just strength but hit is a really fun way to do strength so um i just i just really like those workouts okay so um great uh we have got a comment from biker bob he says he followed a generic training plan from trail running magazine and it worked well for him um he just built up longer runs over the weekend yes so generic training plans can work really well especially when you're just starting out because the main thing to improve your running is to be consistent so a training plan will get you running consistently um but when you've when you've already done that and when you're a bit more experienced you probably want a personalized one just so that you, you just just so that you know exactly what you're doing and exactly how to improve um generic training plans won't work for everybody across the board so um that's just what i mean by that there that's great so um that is training for a half marathon so now we have oh yay i'm back i think i'm back it said resume sorry about that um oh yeah Sally Gilson says, having a nightmare with Wi-Fi tonight and keeps cutting out. <laughs> no, it's me. It's my Wi-Fi. Leon Young saying me too. Um, yep, I am trying to repair it. Okay, so hopefully, oh yay, 16 people are still watching, so I can carry on. Really sorry about this. Okay, so I'm using the Wi-Fi on my phone now. Um, my house Wi-Fi has just gone down. Um, that It's just started raining really hard outside, so I don't know if something has gone wrong with the box that contains the internet at the side of our road. Okay, um, great. Okay, Nigel says we're back. Amazing, that's good. Okay, so stay watching everybody. Um, I'll try and rattle through these next questions. Um, so Carol Jackson was posting in Wild Ginger Gear Test Club and she wants to know about everyone's thoughts on making races more eco-friendly. Um, so I think this is a really, really great question. And being more eco-friendly about trail running is something that I really want to get more involved with in 2020. Like, I I don't want to be all evangelical about it all, um, I, but I want to kind of joyfully encourage everybody to be more eco-friendly um, with their trail running, with their races, um, and um, with everything that we can do, because we love running in these areas, don't we? And we want to preserve them for as long as we can. Um, so obviously there's the biggie, which is the single-use plastic cups. So lots of people are using those reusable cups now, or you can just, like, you know, we're trail runners, we carry a bottle of water with us, don't we? You can just refill that water we don't need a plastic cup so that is great um and um you can also in some races opt out of getting a t-shirt or a medal like i know medals are a bit contentious because a lot of people just do the run for the medal i've got some medals just behind me there you can just see them hanging off my books and some of them i'm really proud of um and i want to talk to you more about medals in the new year as well i'll come to that at the end of the show and um and uh yes so 
basically you can opt out of getting t-shirts and medals. I definitely opt out of getting t-shirts because they're always just unisex t-shirts so they don't fit very well, I never wear them. I actually, my mum made me a bean bag out of all of my old race t-shirts. So it looks like this from all my old race t-shirts. It's an amazing, amazing bean, bean bag with all the races that I've done. So thanks mum. There's a pattern for that on my blog. If you want to make a race t-shirt bean bag, you can just Google Wild Ginger Running race t-shirt bean bag and uh, the whole uh, description of how my mum made it is there. Um, so uh, yeah, some races are opting out of t-shirts and medals um, and also sharing lifts and getting public transport to races is a biggie. So um, there was a, a really good website called Race Lifts, but it doesn't appear to be working anymore. Um, there's no races listed there, certainly. Um, so that's more difficult. But I, I kind of think it's if you're if you've entered a race which is far away, there's there's probably if it's a big one, there's probably a Facebook page about it, and there might even be a Facebook group about it. So you can post on there and say, is anybody else coming from this direction? Do you want to share a lift? Um, if you tweet me and if you tweet about it and you tag me in it, I'm at Wild Ginger Runs on Twitter. Then I'll retweet it for you. Um, if if you hashtag um, UK Run Chat in your tweet about lift sharing to a race, then they will probably see that and they will hopefully retweet that. Um, so there's loads of ways that you can do that kind of thing. Um, and then the other side of what we could do to kind of be more eco-friendly around trail running is to sort of donate our time to doing or money to doing path maintenance so there's um for example there's a charity called fix the fells in the lake district and they work on um uh, sustainable and um, uh, paths and maintaining the path for everybody to work everyone to walk and run on and um for example our trail race that we're organizing um in on the 13th of june um in my local area come do it it's uh neem valley races just google neem valley races you'll find it um it's on si entries as well um we are donating a pound from every race entry to king's cliff transitions which is not a transvestite uh, charity it is a transitions charity they do community projects um including path rebuilding and the 20 mile race actually goes along some of the disused railway that they have worked to open up to the public and make into a, a usable path so we're donating a pound from every race entry for that so there's loads of ways you can be more eco-friendly um, around trail racing and trail running um, and I will be definitely working on this for next year. The big thing is flights as well I think. I asked this to Emily Forsberg when I interviewed her just a couple of weeks ago and she said if you if you have to fly somewhere you know like you're not going to change the world just by not flying to one place. It's frequent flyers that are really doing the damage. So um you could perhaps do something else to counteract it, like you could go vegetarian for the week or um, whilst you're in that place, you could be vegetarian. So there's other ways you can kind of offset your um, your carbon emissions or your lack of eco-friendliness by doing something else. So kind of think outside the box with it. But yeah, if anybody's got any more suggestions about how to be more eco-friendly around trail running, um, then in get commenting in the description below because i'd really like to focus on this for 2020 um let's save the world everyone yay um cool uh abby norman says the beanbag is very cool yes i know my mum made it and my mum is very cool so it couldn't be anything else but really really cool um fantastic um Yep, um, Sally Gilson says most companies allowed you to have two paid charity days a year as part of their CESR responsibilities. That's really interesting. So um, you can go have a little holiday from work and you can help a charity. So I would definitely investigate if your work lets you do something like that. Um, I think that would be really, really awesome. Okay, so let's crack on with the next question because we lost a little bit of time there whilst the internet decided to not work. Ah, this is a really easy question. Okay, so um, uh, oh, the mouse is not working now. It's a total technical fail day. Right, so D, um, DDP Warrior says, I hope you don't mind the question. Please, could you recommend a good trail running magazine or an ultra run one? Loving your YouTube channel. Well, thank you very much, DDP Warrior. Uh, this is a very easy question because um, I 
this is the only trail running magazine, isn't it? Um, so the only trail running magazine that I know of in the UK is the one that I co-founded uh, in 2010. It's called Trail Running Magazine, and it is, um, I'm a bit biased, but it is fabulous. So it's got tons of information like nutrition, gear tests, inspiring features, um, like loads of confidence stuff, navigation, routes as well, inspiration, did I mention inspiration? It's got everything. It's got Joe Pavey in this one one she trains on trails and she's a and she's like an amazing olympic athlete everybody trains on trails and this is tom evans here so he's oh looking very red bull and very uh so yep tom evans is in the magazine as well amazing ultra athlete came third in western states recently um and all round amazingness so um yep give it a go there is an ultra running magazine as well i think it's edited by andy nuttall so if you google that then you'll find that as well so um yep uh, yeah very very easy question moving on to the next one so number six question oh this is another very good question here so let's just get it up on here so that is um <laughs> yes uh the uh, wayne jackson he has just started to following um following me after watching my awesome youtube Thanks. This oh, that's so nice. Um, this is what makes me continue doing the YouTube channel because people are actually watching it and they're actually getting benefit from it. So this is great. Thanks. So he wants to know what the average minute mile pace is for an ultra because he's managed to slow down to 10 minute miles in training. Um, can he go even slower or will he just be last? So... <laughs> Well, I would say, first of all, the people that are sat on the sofa not doing that ultra, they're last. Somebody's got to be last in an ultra, and I don't think that that is anything to be ashamed of. I think just completing an ultra is an absolutely fantastic thing. So I, I would say to anybody who fears being last, don't worry about being last, because um, apart from anything, there'll be a sweeper and they'll be last. And if you are there with them, you can have a nice chat. So it's it's no shame if you're last. Um, you do want to look at the cutoff times, that's for sure, because um, the cutoff times are there for a reason that they're putting on a race um you have to abide by their rules and if the marshals are out all day that sometimes can be a really uncomfortable situation for them a lot of them are volunteers so you do have to observe the cutoff times but if you're going to be within the cutoff times you can walk or run as slow as you like so 10 minute miles i would say is very good for an ultra when when i was doing a lot of ultra running um a year ago um to, like from two to five years ago, um, I was running at nine, uh, nine and a half to 10 minute miles at my fittest for ultra running. So at that pace, I could run really comfortably, nice steady heart rate, 150 beats per minute, that kind of thing, all day, 140, 150 beats per minute. So um, yeah, and that was like chatting, etc. But when I was going up a hill or something, I was hiking and I was maybe doing 12 minute miles, maybe even 17 minute miles up the hills. As long as you're within those cutoff times, you are fast enough, your pace is good for an ultra. And it's better to start off slowly so that you can have more energy towards the end. You don't wanna go off at eight minute miles going, yes, I can run forever at eight minute miles. You can't, not unless you're an elite athlete. Um, so if you think about it, a lot of people walk at three miles an hour. A fast walk would be four miles an hour, but kind of 3.5 miles an hour is most people's walking pace. So if you work that out, it's kind of like 20 minute miles. So 12, so 10 minute miles is really, really good. Um, and I, would, I wouldn't worry, Wayne, about the 10 minute miling. And even if you are the last person on the ultra, which it sounds like you won't be anyway, there's no shame in that as well. I think we, we need to get away from this last place and it's not school anymore, it's just just running and having a nice time on a nice route so it doesn't really matter um, great uh, so next question oh we have just got some um uh, more recommendations for magazines. Biker Bob says the US Trail Runner mag is also good if you can get a hold of it. Yes, you can. You can magazine. So this is not like um, the other magazines. It doesn't have like exercises, training plans. It doesn't have gear reviews. It doesn't have like race listings, um, stuff like that. It just has beautiful illustrations and very very inspiring articles of people who have done a thing or not done a thing or uh, got injured and come back from something or just really 
inspiring stories like people um, overcoming illnesses, overcoming depression and um, transforming themselves. And it's a really, really nice read. It's just, it's just beautiful. Um, so yeah, Like the Wind magazine is good as well. And Stephen Mackay says um, he gets ultra running well. It's digital and it's bi-monthly and it's free. So that's fantastic. Yeah, talking of free digital magazines, I also write for a magazine called Totally Active Magazine, um, which I think is um, part of a sports company. Um, and um, they they cover all sorts of things. So if you're not only into trail running, but you're also into adventurous stuff in general, then Totally Active Magazine is also a good one. Um, UK Hill Walking website also does articles on trail running. I write for them as well. So um, yeah, so there's tons of stuff out there, um, which is good to know because it's our fave thing. So number seven, uh, this one comes up all the time. So I'm just gonna cover this super quick. Um, Scott Bartlett says, um, when people use a hydration bladder, like a camelback or similar, how do they clean it out and store the bladder until the next run? Um, so um, lots of different suggestions and feel free to put some more suggestions on the live chat here. I'm gonna tell you how I sort out my bottles and hydration bladders. I use bottles more than hydration bladders these days just because um, like they're up front, you can access them easily. Um, you can tell how much water you've got left and it's easier to hand them to somebody to pour more water in at a checkpoint. So using bottles, um, but they still, oh, I did have a bottle here somewhere. I'll just get one out in a minute. Um, they, they can get dirty. I tend to um, use water if I can more than anything in them because what makes them like super more likely to get dirty is um, using kind of sugary electrolyte -y type stuff inside them. So I try to just use water in mine because I'm lazy and I don't want to clean them that much. Some of them are dishwasherable, so you can read the instructions. Some of them you can put in the dishwasher. Um, but mostly I would just, if you rinse them out as soon as you get back from your run, then that's best because oh, it doesn't give anything time to grow. So rinse it out and then um, I, would, I would put, you know, like in the cutlery like say you've got like um a cutlery thing next to your washing up thing say if you've got like a knife like it, you wouldn't be this way up but the handle bit of the knife you can put your bottle over the top you can use a wooden spoon bottle over the top of the handle that dries it out and and same with a bladder that will drain it out just put it on the top there like that um and then uh, drain all the water out of the hose bit um, just to hold it up so that the water all drains out. Um, you can get a bit of furring up in the hose. What I've done before is I've got a piece of washing line. I've cut it and, and there's bits inside. There's like bits of... Um, like bits of rope inside the plastic bit and it's frayed out. So I've given, I've um, opened it so it frays out and then I've put it up the tube and kind of uh, manually scrubbed it like that. You can also um, put it in like denture washing um, effervescent tablets. You can get that Milton fluid, which is what they use to sterilize baby bottles, which is what Peter Savage is suggesting below there. Um, so that's another way of sterilizing the bottles. And you can also, some people keep their bottles in the freezer and that doesn't allow any bacteria to grow. So um, that's another good way of doing it. I don't actually do it because my freezer is full. <laughs> so I haven't done that yet. Um, so uh, yeah, Stephen Mackay is also saying he rinses this out, leaving them to dry and puts them in the freezer for a week. Um, to be honest, I'm using mine so often that I feel like there is no time for it to gather any moss. But when I was running around the Isle of Man, my 100 miler for six days, I did notice at the end, um, because I hadn't washed them, I just kept using them, that even the camelback bottle which has the anti um bacterial um coating on it it was in the in the bit that you put in your mouth like the teat bit um that was getting furred up and i'll just show you um this salmon bottle um it's not too bad and i haven't used this one that much um but you can see that stuff is starting to grow in this bit here so what you do is you just you just pull it off like that and then you um you can get you know those little um uh, you can put them between your teeth. They've got like bristly bits on. Um, I don't know what they call them, denture brushes. They're not denture brushes. They're like uh, things that you put in your teeth. I can't fit them between my teeth. You can use them in here to give that a good old clean out. Um, so it, you can peel this bit back as well, give that a good old clean out. So yeah, manual clean out is, um, is good if you've got any kind of grit and like furry stuff that's growing in there. So yeah, that is how... That is how we clean our bottles. I should probably do a separate post about that because it is an FAQ. It gets asked a lot. So it's obviously a biggie in the running world. 
Um, fab, okay. Um, oh, we've got some updates on people doing their um, ultra running and their um, uh, timings. So Sally Gilson saying um, her average pace was 14 minute miles. She has a tendency to chat for too long at, at checkpoints. I would say I'm in that category too. <laughs> but yeah, as long as you're beating the cutoff times, nothing's too slow in an ultra, I don't think. Okay, question eight. Oh, yes, this is a nice question here. So this is a guy called Sim Teen, who is based in the East Midlands, like me. Um, so he is asking me what trails are worth visiting nearby, because he's thinking of checking out Summer Lee's Nature Reserve. Um, I have not heard of that, I've not been there. Um, further out there's the Peak District, not as easy a visit. Yes, the Peak District are our nearest mountains, two hours north. Um, there's also the Chilton Hills, um, past Milton Keynes, uh, down south, they're kind of rolling. I wouldn't say there were mountains like the Peak District, but yeah, it's nice and rolling down there if you're headed like London way, or if you've got friends in London, you wanna meet them halfway. Um, there's also Thetford Forest. It's not that hilly, but it's foresty and it's nice, traily. You can also mountain bike there, which is nice. Um, so what you can do to discover new trails near you is you can um, do a number of things. You can get an OS map and you can look for, um, so, well, I've got a huge OS map here. You can just see the edge of it here on the wall. Um, that's my local area. You can see, um, Oh no, you can't see. But there's, there's a big blue thing and that's called Rutland Water. So look for big blue things like lakes that you can run around. Look for thin, skinny blue things. Not not the motorway ones, but the, the rivers and the canals because there's often footpaths along them. Um, look for hills like um, the contour lines. Um, I've done a film all about how to plan a trail route, which I'll probably, I should link to here. Plan trail route because this tells you how to do this. Um, and that would be really handy for everyone. So uh, 1918 new live. Um, I'll link to that and I'll put it in the film description below as well. Um, but yeah, uh, look for areas of greenery, like forests, stuff like that. Uh, Google for like local country parks, things like that. You can often go to a visitor center, run about. We've got fine shade woods locally. There's loads of nice trails in there. Um, the other really good thing is to look on Strava. So. You can look at my Strava if you want to run around the East Midlands because I do a lot of running off-road in the East Midlands. I also run on-roads with my local club as well. Um, so you'll see lots of like random running around Stamford in a really, really, really strange way. That's our running club. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the, get the map out, look for the paths. Look, they're green or pink or black dotted lines on the map. Look at the key for to find out what they are. Don't, don't try and run along a county boundary. They look very similar if you're not familiar with a map. Um, and yeah, so yeah, just look look on the map, ask ask people, ask your friends, um, and go on Strava heat maps as well. Um, that is great. Cool. Okay. Um, oh, we have a question on the live chat, which is oh, very interesting. Um, let me just answer this question from the live chat. Uh, Sax Slicker says, hi, I'm new to your channel. Hello, uh, welcome to all new people and um, run up to a half marathon in road races. Wants to start trail running, slower obviously, should he go shorter or, or he or her go shorter or will the slower speed compensate? Um, well, um, uh, you could, yes. I think if you go from running a half marathon on a road um, to a half marathon on a trail, um, it, it might take you longer, but it depends what that race is like or what the terrain is like. So you could do a bit of research on the race or the route that you're going to do off road and you could you could do one that isn't very hilly. Like if you've got a half marathon on a canal towpath, that's technically trail running, but it's not gonna take you much longer to do than a half marathon road race. So it really depends on which one you choose and where you're gonna be running. So um, what I would do is, I wouldn't necessarily limit yourself on distance. You sound, you're gonna be fit if you've done 13 mile road races. So you could start with say, 
you could start with a half marathon trail race just make sure it's not like an extreme hilly one with loads of rocks and mountains in it um you could also start with a 10 miler and that might kind of even it out a bit um you could try a trail 10k to start with as well but it really really depends on which race you choose and so definitely just read the website details carefully and just um try to work out from that and the photos the gallery um maybe message the race organizer um well ahead of the race so that they're not like knee deep in getting ready for the race um and just ask them what the race what the train is like um because it's not necessarily the distance that you need to sort of compensate for but it's like the terrain and the hills so um i hope that makes sense to you hope that's answered your question right where was i question number nine i think um oh this is another beginner um running question so that's great so we've got um nick kendall and he says he's an experienced hill walker and cyclist and he was a schoolboy sprinter back in the day um he says is it wise to start running doing trail running or road running so i would say for all runners if you're a beginner runner then you can start trail running for sure like uh, just there's loads of different types of trail running you see and trail running is basically anything that's not on tarmac so the moment you get off tarmac it can be a whole manner of surfaces so it could be like um like i've just said a canal towpath it could be um a nice path in a country park all the way up to running up some kind of rocky steps on a mountain um it's not fell running or sky running fell running is when you're like totally off path like running through bogs and up the hill down the hill kind of thing and it's not sky running which is up in the mountains at altitude if you're on the continent and with um, loads of rocky bits you know like hands on rock scrambling it's not that trail running is running on nice easy-ish paths could be a bit boggy could be a bit slippy grassy steep but it's it's not nothing too horrendous. So if you're already an experienced hill walker, I'd say that is the perfect training for trail running. So I think you will be absolutely fine. Just treat it as if you're going for a hill walk in your running stuff. So walk up the hills, jog the flat bits, jog the downhill bits and enjoy it. Um, you, you'll be absolutely fine. I think you, you can start with road running if you want, but it's not gonna be as exciting. And you might find yourself like veering off into woodland paths and veering off into the park and going around field edges and things like that. So um, I think, yeah, everybody seems to have this impression that trail running is like this tremendously hardcore. They've probably watched some of Killian Dornay's films of him just like running down scree slopes or climbing Everest or something like that. Trail running is not Everest. Trail, <laughs> trail running, it, it can be, <laughs> well, I suppose not really. Um, it, it can trail running can be as hard as you want to make it, basically. Um, and true trail running is on trails. It's not on like dastardly rocky scree slopes. It's that would be more sky running and felt running. So yes, um, it, hill walking routes just sped up a bit. That's all it is. So I hope that answers your question, Nick. Go for it. Definitely go for it. Um, right, okay, so I've got a few more questions, three more questions, and then I'll just do a couple of gear reviews and we'll hear from Anna as well. So fuel in water, so it's Carl Hawkins again. He needs our help. Um, in his three hour runs, he's struggling to eat. He's not a fan of gels. Who likes gels? Does anyone like gels? I can't do gels. I don't run fast enough for them to be effective. <laughs> Um, but uh, yep, he wants to know what fuel he can put in his water. So there was quite a lot of comments below this one in the exclusive patron Facebook group. And overwhelmingly, people were recommending a certain brand and it was Tailwind. Um, which is great. So um, lots of people swear by this. I know lots of elite athletes that use it as well. It seems to be a really, really good brand. Um, basically, it's carbs and electrolytes that you can put into water that mean that you can get in those um, nutrients and salts and, um, and energy w uh, by not eating, basically. Um, so that's great. Tailwind sounds good. I haven't actually tried Tailwind on account of I never buy any nutrition. Uh, I just wait for people to send it to me. So so I'm just going to recommend now a couple of um, nutrition products that um, I have enjoyed lately that have been sent to me. So um, Veloforte, this is some electrolytes here. They also do bars and um, uh, carb stuff as well. And this is Mountain Fuel. They also do flapjacks and um, all types of um, energy that you can add to your water. 
water. So these are the two that I have been enjoying lately. Um, and I also, because I like them, I wanted you guys to also be able to try them for less money. So I actually contacted them and said, hello, may I have a discount please for my patrons and my um, people that watch my channel. So if you use discount code with uh, well, Vela Forte, off your first order, you can get 25% off if you use the code WILDG25. This is in the description below as well. And to get 15% off Mountain Fuel at any time, the code is WILDGINGER. So for the exact spelling of these, then just take a look in the description below. And it's on my blog as well um, in multiple places. So um, you're welcome. And hope you enjoy those products as well. Um, you can also make a DIY version of an electrolyte or a um, energy drink. Um, I've just put that information in my book. Um, so uh, basically it's salt, table salt, add a pinch of table salt um, and add some squash to your drink. Um, and if you wanna make it into an energy drink, then you wanna add um, just like a, a, ta a teaspoonful of sugar as well and give it a good shake. Um, that's what Joss Naley used to do. He used to leave a little bottle of like, um, sugary squash kind of cordial type drink with a bit of salt in it um at the top of like he'd leave it at the top of haystacks and then he'd get it like halfway around he'd just have a few sips and then leave it there and then go back to get it later um so he that used to keep him going that used to keep him right he told me so if it's good enough for joss naylor a diy energy drink then it's good enough for me and it's cheaper as well than buying these products but they are very handy these products Okay, so, um, yep, everyone in the live chat is like, tell and tell and tell, and I must try some. I must like email them and say, what is this all about? Because everybody's raving about you. They must be very, very good. I will try them. Um, okay, so last couple of questions, and then we'll get some gear reviews. Um, so, oh, interesting question. Zip lube. Whoa. So, Cat Roberts. Oh, I've just made it go away. Um, Kat Roberts says, um, the zips on her energy pack are starting to seize up a bit. It was only £20, so I don't think she feels like she can send it back to the manufacturer like you would if it was a £100 pack. Um, so she wanted some tips for getting them to run smoothly again. Um, so this was great because we had loads and loads of answers to this, um, which we have four different answers to this. Um, so the one I was going to suggest was candle wax. Brand Van Diemen recommended that. Um, and Alex Dehoto seconded that as well. Um, and then also I was going to mention this as well, WD-40 from Emily Jacobs. Um, and then two options that I didn't know about before. Rich Simpson said, um, have a look for McNett Zip Care Maintenance. Um, you can get that on Amazon apparently. And Tim Croft says, dive shops sell special wax for wetsuit, which also works in this case too. So there you go. You may have bought a 20 pound pack cat, but you can still keep it going with the miraculous use of various lube. So good luck with that cat and uh, do message us back to tell us how you got on. I hope nobody else has any zip problems with their kit um, it will also work uh, with any zip you know um, waterproof um, on your leggings that kind of thing all zips then um, oh one last very quick question Andrew Topping says enjoy your reviews but I didn't get to hear your top tip about rear battery packs from sliding down um, I'm guessing this is for um, a head torch I think it was on the head torch film that he posted this so basically if you've got a bit of a heavy battery pack on the back of your head torch um, it it can kind of slide down unless you tie your um, torch so tight you're going to get a migraine so what I would do in that instance and some torches come with this if they know that their battery is a little bit heavy on the heavy side they'll have um, a bit of elastic that goes over the top as well so you won't just get the round head bit you'll get the over the top bit as well um, you can also retrofit that on your own torch if it doesn't come with it, just by looping a bit of elastic round and doing a bit of sewing. Um, um, but if the battery is really kind of dragging on the back of your head, then I would consider, in all seriousness, getting an extension cable and putting that uh, battery into your backpack because... Um, you don't want to be carrying around a load of weight on your head. I think like 200 grams on the head is probably the maximum that you'd want to have up there. Um, so yeah, I'd consider getting an extension lead and popping that battery into your pack. Um, especially for things like ultra running when you're running through the whole night and you want a battery that's going to last you that long. Okay, fantastic. 
So, um, great, that's great. I've answered all 12 questions, which is brilliant. And now I'm just gonna give a quick review of, um, we're just gonna quickly review a couple of gear products and then we're gonna hear from Anna, who has been training for her 145 mile run. So these, first of all, I've done a little film of these because I was taking them on a night run recently, but these are really cool. So these are a pair of socks from Carabrite. Um, and they've asked me to review these for them, um, which I have no problems doing because they're really good. Um, so they reflect, obviously. So this part here is around your ankle. And so if you're running, as long as you haven't got your long leg and running tights over the top of them, <laughs> then uh, then they will reflect. Uh, so if you've got any road sections, then these are a really good idea for making yourself really visible because um, movement is what makes cars and traffic notice you. And so if you've got your visibility on your feet then that's something that's constantly moving so that's going to be really really bright for any cars um so yeah they're they're quite a slim sock um but they fit nicely they're nice and breathable um the only um downside that i found to these socks um and i've i've just been messaging the pr guy today um is the sizing is a little bit out so this is a size four to seven this sock here um, but as you can see, it's quite long. Um, so the heel uh, was actually, this heel material was kind of um, up to my ankle. It it still felt comfortable like that, but you just, you just wouldn't want to wear them like that um, if you can help it. So he's sorting out the sizing. So the next batch that come through should be fine with the sizing, um, but yeah, uh, they're a really nice sock. It makes a good stocking filler, I think. Like it is a stocking, and it makes a good stocking filler. So I'm just going to show you a little uh, film what I made earlier of me testing these socks. Here we go. There we go. That's my shoe. So these, so these are the Carabite reflective, reflective socks, and, and this, this is, is my head, head torch, torch reflecting, reflecting on them. them. So and it's really, really good, good as long as you're not wearing, wearing long leggings, leggings that, that go down. down. Past, past the socks, the socks like, like this, this. <laughs> and, and also, also this, this is, is a pair, a pair of, size of size four to seven, seven. and the and heel, heel uh, is all the way, way up, up my, my ankle, ankle just, just here. here. That, that is, is the heel. The heel. Um, um, so, so these, these are, are far, far too big, big for their, their sizing, sizing of four, four to seven. seven. But once, but once they get that sorted, it's going to be a really, a really awesome, awesome sock for any sections where you have to run on the road before you get to the trail. There we go. That's what I made earlier. Oh, I could be on Blue Peter. So um, the next review is a pair of Salomon shoes, which are quite exciting. Um, so these are they. Um, this is the Supercross, um, which is quite a funny name because it's like, oh, I've got I've got the Supercross. What, your Supercross? No, no, I've got the Supercross. Ha, that just made me laugh earlier <laughs> when I was researching it. So, so these, um, to be honest, I didn't want to wear these because they are beautiful. I did not want to get them muddy, but in the name of research, I have gone out and I have got them a little bit not as muddy as those shoes that you just saw me wearing um but yes I have gone out and got these and then I ran through a load of puddles to wash it off so that I could so I could show you these in my office even so it's putting a load of rubbish all over my keyboard um so um I'm just going to put up a few stats about this shoe um it's the, a new one for Salmon um so let's just get the stats up I got them earlier Salomon here we go right so there we go it's a hundred pounds the men's one is also a hundred pounds um they also do a Gore-Tex one which is a hundred and twenty pounds um I don't tend to wear Gore-Tex trail running shoes just on account of the water can go in over the top and or or in here oh no well it can't if it's cortex it can go in over the top if you um are wearing it for a long time or if it's raining and then you just end up with a really heavy shoe um i do really like a cortex shoe when i'm working on events like um for example running festivals because i'm always kind of running around through um i'm not actually running and then getting changed and going home i'm there for the whole day so i really appreciate a waterproof sock um, shoe in that um, occasion because it just means I'm like running through I'm kind of going through grass all the time. The other thing which is which I like about this shoe though is that inside um, it doesn't have much of an arch and so in the speed crosses they do have a quite a high arch and for me it's in the wrong place for my foot so it always rubs and I have to wear double layer socks with it. 
Um, so for me, that was a really good plus point about the shoe. The other thing about the shoe, which will please some people with wider feet, is that it has got a roomier toe box. So um, wet feet all the time. But for actual running, um, I don't usually wear a waterproof shoe. Um, so then there's some more details here. Um, so we've got um, a drop of 10 mil. That's that's crucial to know. Um, and the weight, 270 grams. So um, so they're light. They're all on the big side. So that might explain the roomier toe box. I'd need to get it in a size six to sort of compare that. But it does feel roomier. Um, but it is so it is a bigger shoe. So I'd go normal sizing on these rather than advising a half size um, bigger. Um, the quick lacing is great, like really, really quick. And then you just, um, you just pull it in, push this down, um, and then you hook this in here. Um, it can come out, like if you're running through brambles and stuff, like it, it can kind of come out and then flop about like this, um, but you just tie it back in again. Um, I personally, like loads of people love quick lacing. I personally prefer traditional lacing because then you can really hone in on the on the fit specifically all the way up the shoe. With this, you sort of pull it from the top and it sort of, there's a, you can cheese wire your hands a bit if you're trying to just adjust it. And then it never, it, you can never pull this bit tight but this not tight, do you know what I mean? Um, traditional lacing is the only thing that allows you to do that. Um, then, um, uh, so yes, it's a really nice shoe. I have been enjoying wearing this. The grip is good. So we have, but there's one thing about the grip that I need to um, kind of canvas your opinions on. So the grip is um, about four mil, these uh, studs here. Uh, it's a nice, good level of grip for trail running. Really, really good for mud, really good for grass, sloppy, boggy, grassy, muddy, everything like that. Um, less good on wet rock. I don't know how anybody else feels. I would really welcome your comments below because I've heard all sorts. Um, I know people who agree with me. I know people who definitely don't agree with me. And the people who probably don't agree with me the most are the people who run in salmon shoes all the time. And they are a lot of top athletes. So basically what I find is when I wear these shoes, no, no shoes grip entirely on wet rock, but I find that salmon shoes in particular it's like ice like you step on the rock and it's like poof it's immediately it's kind of like dangerously ah whereas if I'm wearing my Brooks Adrenalines or my um, Innovate shoes they don't have that same skid feel they they don't grip to wet rock like no, you'd be hard pushed to find anything that would grip to some a slippy slaty mossy rock but I just find that these skid out way quicker than any other shoe so much so that if you're kind of running along and like I was running along on this kind of um, at the Coniston copper mines and there was grass and then rock and then grass and I, I was deliberately avoiding the rocky bits because they were just so skatey whereas in another shoe I could I was fine to walk down rocky steps um, in them and they wouldn't skid out straight away and I'm just really keen to just chat to some more people about this because Killian Drone cannot be wearing a pair of shoes that skid out from under him, surely. So I do need you guys' help to just, like, your experiences, basically. Um, I've talked to a couple of people who have the same problem as me with the Salomon shoes, and I've talked to other people who don't notice it at all. So um, your opinions below would be excellent. But this, if you like Salomon shoes, and if you don't ever find a problem with the skatiness of the grip on wet rock, um, and you like the quick lacing, and you want a 10 mil drop shoe, um, um, that's quite firm, um, firm uh, underneath. Um, I would say this is a really, really good buy, especially at £100. Like shoes these days are coming to like 120, 140 quid. £100 is a good price point at retail price for this shoe. So you can find this online for more like 60 probably in like when it when it's not new anymore. So that this is one to watch, I think, watch out for in the sales, definitely, because it will be down, um, down in price, I would have thought for sure. Um, James Frost is just asking again about the drop on the shoe. It's 10 mil, this shoe. But it doesn't, to me, it didn't feel like 10 mil. It feels like a flat. It feels fairly flat, but it's 10 mil. So it's 10 mil. Um, there we go. Uh, Biker Bob says, Salomon shoes, not for wide feet. Yes, but this one is a little bit wider, as I said. Um, but it is, uh, um, it is bigger um, all round. So this is a 6.5. I usually get a 6.5 and it's just the right size. This is 6.5. It's also too long. Um, so I do need to test a size six as well. 
Um, Stephen Mackey says he is a fan of Salomon shoes, but he finds them a bit slippy on rock. Using Raid Light at the moment and Innovate Mud Claw find them okay. Cool. That's good. Yeah, I, I feel like I should wear like maybe one Salomon shoe on one foot and like an Innovate shoe on the other foot and see how that goes. But I, I just know in myself that when I step on a rock, I don't trust this shoe as much as I would my Brooks Adrenaline shoe and they are road shoes. So, <laughs> so yes, um, it could be that there's more surface area to stick to the rock on the road shoe because it's um, not got as aggressive grips. I do understand that, but yeah, it's just interesting, isn't it? Like um, comparing the shoes. Um, so James Frost says, ah, it feels more like a six or eight mil. Um, yeah, it, it feels more to me like an eight mil. Um, yeah, it feels more to me like that. Um, yeah, it definitely doesn't feel like 10 to me. Um, I was surprised when I saw 10 on it. Yeah, cool. Um, and Nigel Barnett says he's a big fan of waterproof socks. They work really well for him on the trail. Yes, yes. I was speaking to Nigel about this on Saturday at the Patreon run, and he was showing me the waterproof socks that he had bought on my recommendation. So that's really cool. Yes, so um, the my kind of favorite socks, um, sock and shoe setup is like a pair of Innovate Cross Claw, well, X Claw. Um, they're like the wide version of the Mud Claw. Um, they're really, really grippy. You wear them in mud and bog, and you just whack on a pair of waterproof socks and you kind of can get away with not having as wet feet for as long a time obviously your feet get sweaty so they will get damp um, later on in the run but you can kind of get away with um, getting um, not getting as wet feet and also not getting as cold feet as well because they stop the wind as well so that's that's um that's really good um, right so I've done the two reviews uh, now we just need to catch up with Anna um, and then I'm gonna tell you what is on the next live a little bit of an update. So um, this is Anna. So I ran with Anna earlier today. Um, so Anna's one of my patrons, um, but she's also a friend of mine. She's in my running club. Um, she just really kindly signed up to me on Patreon. And um, she um, is also organizing the trail run with me. Um, We're organizing a trail race in June. It's um, just from Fotheringhay, which is near us. It's called the Neem Valley Races. And I don't know if I've got a little thing just here. Uh, oh no, I haven't. Never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, but if you go on SI entries and you look for Neem Valley races, then you'll find it there. So um, Anna is doing a 145 mile run on the Grand Canal, um, Grand Union Canal race um, in May, and I'm going to video her. Um, so this is just a little update on how her training's going, and it's really interesting because she's got two young boys um, and a full time job, and this is how she's juggling such. A, a vast volume of training she's she's incredible I just she makes me just feel like just going back to bed because it's not worth it <laughs> no she's really inspiring here is Anna oh, but it would if my hard drive would wake up <laughs> it's just doing the spinning thing but Anna will be with us in just a second when the hard drive wakes up with her interview Okay, okay, Anna, Anna how, how is your training, training for, for the 143 mile Grand Union Canal race? Okay, really good, really good, really good thank, thank you. you. Um, I just, I just did a 28, 28 mile run yesterday, yesterday just, just literally dropped, dropped the kids off at school, school put, my put my backpack, backpack on, on, and just, just went, went. <laughs> until, until school, school pick-up pick time. time. So that, so that was, that was that really good. Just had to be sort of really inventive with how I fit in the training runs. Like with like it, it being Christmas, Christmas time as well, well family, family time. time. The, kids the kids wanted to go and see Santa, Santa the other, the other day, day, so my, so my husband, husband drove the children, children there, and I ran the 17, 17 miles <laughs> over, over to Boston to fit that run in, changed your clothes at the other end, and then carried on again with life. But yeah, it's going good. We're doing two double run days, some easy runs, a couple of tempo runs, and then just just focusing on time on my feet and building the miles up. That's, That's brilliant. brilliant. And, and so, so how, are how are you feeling about, about the challenge, challenge itself, itself um, going, going into, into 2020? 2020. I, I've, I've been really positive and really, really excited. excited. I, I've, I've got, got lots, lots more routes, routes planned, and, and I've also found out that, that there's um, a, canal a canal that runs from Leicester, Leicester right the way through to Market, Market Harbour, Harbour, going by Fox and Locks. So, so I'm, I'm going, going to, to attempt to run, to run that, that, get the get train, train up to Leicester, to Leicester run all the way back to Uppingham, so that should be 44 miles, and it gives you a bit of canal experience as well. So, along with lots of other local trail runs. Cool, and you said you'd read a really good book lately. 
Yes, yes, I did. So I did. Uh, a friend, friend of mine recommended, recommended a book called, called Running, Running and Stuff, Stuff by James, James Adams, Adams. Um, quite, quite a, a prolific trail, well, ultra, ultra runner. runner. And, and he, he ran, ran the Grand Union, Union Canal, Canal twice. twice. Um, and, and the book, the book has, has just been really invaluable to the training because he's just come up with so many ideas, different things I need to focus on. I started introducing some night running to my training to get used to running on uneven ground with the head torch. But yeah, it's good. And that's really motivated me. Keep you on, on track. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, well, full, full steam ahead, ahead and, and have a very Merry Christmas, Christmas. And I think and you should eat at least 20 minutes of pies a day. Yeah, it's Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's Anna. That was us. We went out for like a five mile run this morning. Um, apologies to anyone who is trying to follow me on Strava at the moment. My watch won't sync up to Garmin Connect for some reason, so I think I'm going to have to do it manually. But I did go on a run with Anna this morning and she was just on fire. Like she'd just done 28 miles the day before and she, well, she was ahead of me. I was just like, oh, because I went to running club last night and I was feeling like I'd done some work and that was only like five or six miles last night. Um, but yeah, she is on a roll and really, really, um, really, really excited to follow her in this really long journey. She's Anna's raising money for um uh, for sans which is a, a charity that helps people who've had stillborn children um because really sadly she had um uh, her son james was born at eight months um stillborn so it he would have been 10 this year so that's why she's doing this absolutely amazing challenge in his memory and to raise loads of money for sans so like just well done anna and oh i have got her just giving page just here so if you are feeling in the christmas spirit and you want to um help anna along towards her target then and it's justgiving.com slash fundraising slash Anna dash rug two. So definitely give her a shout on there. Okay, so that is like everything for tonight. I just need to mention a couple of things which are upcoming. So I am, yay, selling t-shirts and buffs. Woo, so if you would like a wild ginger running t-shirt or a wild ginger running buff, then you can actually buy one. And I'm just trying to find a, the photo. Here we go. I have a photo of me wearing the buff. Ta-da! Um, the buff is very useful in all kinds of weather conditions, including mist and including a nice day at Burley House. This is my local uh, trail running ground, um, the lovely, beautiful grounds of Burley House, and that is me pointing to the buff there. Um, I know I have just sent out a load of wild ginger running buffs um, to a lot of my patrons as a Christmas present, so I've kind of shot myself in the foot with the selling of buffs, but maybe you want two buffs, or maybe you aren't a patron and you would like a wild ginger running buff. Um, they are online in my shop, um, which is here. Um, on my blog, on my website, wildgingerrunning.co.uk slash shop. You can also buy a t-shirt. So I'm wearing one now, um, but I, it's not really a good one to show you because um, uh, because basically this uh, uh, design is not available yet. Um, that's an exclusive design that was sent to patrons. Um, but basically you can get a t-shirt like this, but with my logo stuck smack down in the middle and um, the change from how they were originally is that they're, they're now in colour so it's um, a nice you can get a blue t-shirt you can get a pink you can get um, a grey you can get uh, I think you can get black as well there's kind of different colours you can get lime green as well um, and it will have the wild ginger running logo which is uh, just here on the screen just there so it will be look like that on your t-shirt so and then I'll be launching other colours and other things in the future but I've just thought I'd start small so yeah if you want to support the channel Channel, then um, definitely buy a t-shirt um, or a buff. Thank you very much. Um, they make excellent Christmas presents, but it might not be, they might not arrive in time for Christmas by now. Oh, and the training camp. So yeah, I just want to mention the training camp because um, it's really, really good opportunity for anybody who is a beginner runner to come and have some amazing coaching from Dave Taylor, who is uh, from Fell Running Guide. He is um, a coach. Um, he teaches fell running. He teaches trail running. He teaches um, um, all kinds of mountain like techniques uphill downhill we'll have the guy from lecky poles there doing a demonstration letting you use the lecky poles um we'll also have uh, the silver head torches there for the night run so you can use a silver head torch um they're also going to put a little something in the goodie bag for us as well. And um, hopefully Montaigne are going to put something in the goodie bag too. So there'll be a goodie bag for everybody who comes. And if you're a patron, you'll get extra stuff as well in the goodie bag. I'm going to organise some really nice patron stuff there. Um, so... Um, so this is the training camp and I, I did have a nice picture of uh, where we are running because we're running from Castleton and it's just a really beautiful place. It's in the Peak District and... Um, uh, 
Oh, where's it gone? Uh, oh, I can't find it. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, right. The Wild Ginger Running Training Camp. Here we go. Uh, I'm sure I put that, loaded it up earlier. But yes, this is me running along um, the ridge between Mamtor and Lewes Hill. Um, it's a really, really beautiful place in the Peak District. Um, and we can get loads of really good running done. And what I would say is I've had several emails from people going, oh, am I going to be fast enough for the training camp? So when we say training camp, we don't mean it's like, you know, like a track athlete camp, like, um, like of the likes of Paula Radcliffe, like, you know, it's not going to be a beasting session. It's a, it's more skills and sociability and enjoyment and learning. And what we will be doing is jogging along at a nice steady pace, everyone chatting. Um, I'll be at the back, definitely chatting to others at the back. Um, and we will be learning. So we'll be jogging to somewhere, then learning something, doing a demo, practicing something, jogging a bit further on and practicing something else. So it's, this is not a place where you need to be really, really fast. It's not a race there's no competitiveness everybody is going to be there to be friendly and supportive so that's the atmosphere that it's going to be at the training camp we've also got anita bean author of the runner's cookbook she is coming to do a talk for us so we'll have some nutrition talk as well um, and i'm going to be showing you an exclusive first showing of my kate rath ultra film um, which is uh, about 15 minutes long um, and it's just about my kate rath ultra experience uh, two years ago it's taken me that long to edit it because it was loads of footage um so that is exclusive showing um great so um then is there anything else oh yes next live chat okay so the next next wednesday is obviously christmas day merry christmas everybody thank you for supporting the channel it's absolutely amazing to have you here it's gonna be christmas day so i don't know about you but i'm gonna struggle to do a live broadcast on christmas day and i think you'll struggle to watch it too so um actually i'm gonna take a break i'm not gonna do a live broadcast on christmas day i have made a blooper reel for you guys um and that will come out on monday at 5 p.m next week Week. so that's my little Merry Christmas to everybody I'm wearing this hat and um, then the first live broadcast will then be New Year's Day which is a Wednesday so so I am going to do a live broadcast on New Year's Day um, I'm going to a party with my running club friends that evening so it may or may not be good but if you are there if you're hungover at 6 30 p.m on New Year's Day hopefully you've recovered by then and been on a run um, let's make a pact like let's all go on a run on New Year's Day last year I think I went to Rutland Water and I I really wanted to do a wild swim on Christmas on, on New Year's Day to start the new year and we went to I went to Rutland Water with my sister-in-law and the water was really low at the place where you're allowed to swim in the summer and so I basically it was like this much water so basically it was in my swimming costume I just ran in and did like a crocodile roll in it went ah and then ran out again <laughs> And then I put it on my Instagram and I tagged Rutland Water and they told me off for swimming when there wasn't a lifeguard there. <laughs> so be very careful in the place that you choose to do your wild swim on New Year's Day. I might go to somewhere better and actually jump in, you know, like wouldn't that be an amazing start to the year? Anyway, let me know what you do and we'll all catch up with each other at half six on New Year's Day. And what I want from you is I want to know what your favourite medal of 2019 has been and what are your plans for 2020 so we could do new year's resolutions if you want but i kind of think that's a bit overdone so what i really want us to talk about is what plans that we've got for 2020 like what races that you're doing um and what um medals you're looking forward to getting if you're a medal type person you can see mine behind me just there um I'll talk about my favourite couple of medals and I'll get a couple of the patrons to talk about their medals that they're most proud of and we'll just do a bit of a chat around um, doing things. It doesn't have to be a race, it could just be your own challenge. I'm a real big fan of people doing their own challenge, like you might want to run a certain amount of miles a week, you might want to do the trail running, run a thousand miles challenge, or you might want to set up your own thing where you're going to do your own kind of three peaks or something like that. So let me know what you're doing in 2020 and let me know what your best medal is for 2019. That is what we're going to talk about in the next live show. T I'm really excited about 2020. I've got tons of 
um, interviews with elite athletes from the UTMB that I haven't put out yet. I put one out on Monday, so make sure you watch that. It was all about motivation. I've got like a great interview with Ian Sharman from the UTMB. I've got, oh no, that was, sorry, that was a Skyline Scotland one that went out on Monday. So yeah, Skyline Scotland interviews and UTMB interviews are all going to come out like month by month in 2020. So really excited about that. I've got um, Camelback is sponsoring me to do some um, high intensity interval training workouts as well. So they'll be out in 2020 and then I'm going to hook up with Adam Smith um, who is a physio and we're going to do some injury moves and like foam rolling videos um, I want to catch up with Shane Benzie as well to do some more technique videos there's just like tons of stuff going to go on in 2020 so really excited to bring you um, more but just tell me as well like write in the comments below what kinds of stuff you want to see on the channel I do get suggestions from time to time can't do all of them obviously because I've got like plans and stuff but yeah I want to do more gear reviews as well so yeah just let me know um because I make this channel for you I want you to watch it it's it's not for, I don't watch any of it afterwards I just talk about it so if you want to tell me some ideas for 2020 then please let me know okay thank you all for watching this mega mega long broadcast maybe i shouldn't answer a dozen questions next time um, but um have an amazing christmas um enjoy the blooper video and um and yeah uh, and have a look at the live chat because lots of diff lots of chat going on about the salmon shoes um yep and lots of smiles from guy greater x there we go <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for watching, everybody. And um, I will see you on New Year's Day with some chat about our plans for 2020. Okay, over and out, everybody. Have a great Christmas.